Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Reimagining Young People's Future webinar. I would like to first begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land in which we meet today and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people here today. My name is Tina Quek and I will be your MC and I'm very excited and I've been looking forward to this morning because personally I'm a strong advocate for youth-led discussions. The Reimagining Youth Steering Committee Group have identified key areas that are affecting young people the most, particularly during the lockdowns in Victoria. And I can't wait to hear from some of them this morning as they share their experiences and insights and show policymakers how all these issues impact the lives of young people. But first, some online housekeeping. Thank you all for joining us on Slido. If you have any questions for one of our presenters, please submit it through the online platform. If you are on your desktop, this should appear on the page. Um, and if you're on the mobile, um, I think there's a tab at the top of the screen with Q&A, which, which will take you to our submission page. You will be able to vote on questions you would like to be asked by clicking on the green tick. I encourage you to submit as many questions as you can and vote out questions that uh, you would like to get answers for. Our team will be moderating and we'll try to get through as many questions during our Q&A section, which I'm really looking forward to. Um, please do note that as the Royal Commission into Mental Wellbeing is not produced by Big Health, so we won't be taking questions on this, but we do welcome questions on the research presented by Dr. Megan and Dr. Stephen Carbine. Before we get into those presentations, I'd like to introduce Dr. Sandra DeMaio, who is the Chief Executive Officer at Big Health. Dr. DeMaio is a medical doctor and globally renowned public health expert and advocate. Having held the role of medical officer for non-communicable conditions, I always struggle with that word, um, and nutrition with the Department of Nutrition for Health and Development at the World Health Organization. Dr. DeMaio was previously the CEO of the EAT Foundation, the science-based global platform for food systems transformation. Welcome, Dr. DeMaio. Thanks very much, Tina, and uh, it's wonderful to join you. And uh, I, uh, I would say you're not the only person who um, struggles to pronounce non-communicable. It's taken me many years to get that right, and I still stumble on it sometimes. <laughs> um, so I, too, would just like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land that I'm on today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and their elders past, present and emerging. Uh, in particular, I'd like to acknowledge the emerging elders and leaders from First Nation communities all across uh, this land, all across the state we call Victoria, and of course, the country we call Australia and even beyond, uh, and the uh, continuing leadership that young people from uh, Aboriginal backgrounds, Torres Strait Islander backgrounds, uh, provides uh, in uh, today uh, across society so critical and so critical uh, to the work that we try to do here also uh, at Vic Health in supporting uh, those voices in the best ways that we can. So it's a real uh, pleasure to be able to join you this morning and um, and just provide a few words as uh, Tina you said my name's Sandro I'm the CEO here at Vic Health it's clear that COVID-19 and its impacts have prompted a once in a generation opportunity to reimagine life and health here in Victoria. In 2020, VicHealth hosted a series of in-depth discussions on how we can work with all Victorians, diverse communities and a range of different sectors to create a healthier, more sustainable and more equitable Victoria for everybody. This next phase of this important work is about young people's futures and elevating their voices in this conversation. The speakers will include four young people speaking about their personal experiences, their lived experience as experts in being young across Victoria at this time in history, and ideas on what is needed into the future. The two content traditional experts, uh, Dr. Megan Lim and Dr. Stephen Carbone, uh, thank you both for your continued support uh, for our work, but also for this important work supporting and working with young leaders across Victoria. We know looking at the evidence that young people has, have been disproportionately impacted by the coronavirus pandemic, uh, particularly indirectly, but even today I read new evidence on the long-term outcomes uh, of the coronavirus uh, virus itself and the disease 
that really is having indiscriminate effects on the long-term health of populations uh, and those who have experienced the disease, uh, young and old. But we know that the indirect effects, uh, disruptions of education, of major transitions in life, of employment, of a sense of belonging, connectedness, and a sense of purpose have all been disproportionately felt by young people across our community, across all communities, and indeed around the world. Vic Health's Coronavirus Victorian Wellbeing Impact Study and the Burnett Institute's Young People Coping with Coronavirus Interim Report, led by one of our speakers today, Dr. Megan Lim, show a concerning decline in life satisfaction, wellbeing satisfaction, and meaningful social connection from and for young people over the last 12 months due to the coronavirus pandemic. Young people reported being heavily impacted by job losses, disrupted education, reduced social connection, insecure housing, and of course, increased anxiety about the future, about their future. These disruptions have happened at a critical life stage for young people who are already coping with major transitions and establishing lifelong health uh, behaviours, trajectories, opportunities. The Royal Commission into Victoria's mental health system recently delivered its final report. The report is a culmination of 24 months inquiry with 65 recommendations that set out the reforms required to deliver a reimagined health uh, and mental health and wellbeing system for all Victorians. Big Health welcomes the Royal Commission's focus on young people as a priority and on improving mental wellbeing for all Victorians by investing in prevention and health promotion. With three quarters of mental health challenges presenting before the age of 25, as a doctor, I know that it's critical that those of us working in prevention are not only listening to young people's voices, but engaging young people and ultimately handing over the decision-making and power uh, opportunities to young people to design and decide uh, the own, their own systems and their own trajectory for achieving and maintaining good health. Our second speaker this morning, Dr. Stephen Carbone, will reference the Vic Health Royal, Vic Health, uh, Royal Commission's uh, evidence review that we undertook uh, earlier last year in exploring what kind of work we can, do, we can be doing in the health promotion space to better support positive health and wellbeing for all Victorians. Fortunately, we know that young people are incredibly resilient. They're creative, they're resourceful, they're interconnected, and, they're insight, and they have incredible insights into their own experiences during the pandemic. Therefore, Vic Health fundamentally believes that it is vital that their voices are central in recovery. And as I said, it's not just about listening. It's not just about handing over a seat at the table. It is about handing over power itself. We've brought six people together to, to drive this next stage of our Reimagining Health uh, series. Andrew, Lyndall, Jack, Alex, Claire, and Rihanna are the Reimagining Young People's Futures Youth Steering Group. They were selected from VicHealth's partnerships with youth peak agencies, including YACVIC, FYA, YMCA, and includes one person from VicHealth's existing youth advisory panel. I'm thrilled to welcome everyone here today to hear your voices. And I'm personally looking forward to hearing your experiences and learning how I as a CEO and we as an agency can do better for and with young people across Victoria. I'll now hand back to Tina to introduce the first speaker. Thank you, Tina. Thank you, Sandro. I couldn't agree more. You know, I think it's really just so important to listen to young people's voices. And like you said, it's more than listening, but also about handing over power. I would also now like to introduce Dr. Stephen Carbone, who is the Executive Director of Prevention United. Uh, Dr. Carbone has extensive clinical experience in mental health, having worked as a general practitioner with an interest in mental health and as a medical officer in Victoria's specialist mental health services. Stephen also has considerable experience in mental health policy, program and service development and program evaluation through his roles in the Department of Health 
and Human Services, Mental Health Branch, um, Origin, Youth Health, and also Headspace, um, as well as Big Health and Beyond Blue. So Stephen, over to you. I'm really keen to hear your presentation. Thanks very much, uh, Tina, and thanks, Sandra, and thanks to Vic Health for uh, giving me this opportunity. And I too would just like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm talking to you from, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and also pay my respects to Elders past, present, and emerging. So my presentation will look at uh, the primary prevention of uh, mental health conditions. So. Uh, to set the scene, I think it's very important that we try to understand one fundamental sort of concept um, in mental health promotion, and that is the difference between what you might call good or positive mental health, or what I prefer to call mental well-being, and mental ill health or mental health conditions like depression, anxiety, etc. Um, different people use different terminology, and that's one of the confusing things in the mental health space. But this diagram shows that at one end, the positive sense of feeling good emotionally, functioning well psychologically and socially. At the other end, feeling stressed, distressed, having um, difficulties in day-to-day -day functioning. And uh, that's a fundamental uh, difference that we need to understand because the truth is everyone has a level of mental health. Mental health is not just something that relates to people with depression or anxiety, et cetera. And the other important thing that uh, we need to stress is that our mental health and well-being is not fixed. It fluctuates, it changes, and it varies according to a myriad of both personal um, intrinsic sort of characteristics, but also um, what's happening in our life, in our life circumstances, in the social environments around us. Now, the good thing is that there are steps that we can each individually take to promote and protect our mental health and well-being. But really, on top of that, we also need to look at what we collectively need to do to create the sorts of environments, school, uh, workplace, community environments that help to promote good mental health and well-being for everyone. So the way I look at it, really, a, a mental health system really needs to have two integrated components. One component that focuses on mental health promotion, and I'll talk about that in a moment, and one that focuses on mental health care. And that's the part that we're most familiar with, you know, the, the, the doctors, the nurses, the psychologists, the social workers, the peer workers, everyone who is supporting uh, people with an existing mental health condition or challenge. But mental health promotion to me is a bit of an umbrella term, and it's that big picture macro side of the mental health system. It tends to, the activities tend to target groups and communities, using public health strategies that have been used by health promotion experts for a long, long time. And it burrows in to try to tackle the root causes or the upstream factors. So it focuses on three broad things, I think. Promoting good mental health or mental well-being, preventing mental health conditions from occurring in the first place, so preventing the onset. Uh, but also trying to support and encourage uh, people who are struggling, experiencing difficulties to, to seek help for those conditions. By contrast, mental health care is often that one-to-one -one interaction. It targets individuals, their families, carers and supporters. And as we know, it uses a range of medical, psychological and psychosocial strategies that are about addressing the personal experience of mental health for that individual, that family. Um, and again, there's such a, a wide way to classify mental health care. A, a common way nowadays is to talk about low intensity treatments, you know, for example, online programs, peer support, high intensity, more traditional mental health care through primary, secondary or tertiary services. And that includes both early intervention as well as recovery support. And then of course, um, crisis support and suicide prevention. So my talk is just going to focus on one aspect of mental health promotion, and that is the prevention of mental health conditions. So again, just to, to sort of ground this in a little bit of theoretical context, the, the thing we know about mental health conditions, and in fact, physical health conditions too, is that they often present through a series of stages. They don't just happen one day you're okay, the next day you've got, uh, you know, severe depression. It's more that we sort of go through a, a phase of feeling well, developing some sub-threshold symptoms, 
and then we may have you know a clinically diagnosable episode of depression or anxiety or psychosis you know with the right sort of supports and 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 as i said that's a range of holistic inputs you know uh, we achieve recovery or, or remission but then from there things can can you know vary a lot of people have one episode of a condition um, remain well for the rest of their life. For others, they may relapse or experience recurrences. So prevention can target any point in that pathway, any point in that progression. And again, there's some confusing language here, which I'll try to unpack. But when we talk about prevention, we can either talk about primary prevention, which is about stopping the condition from occurring in the first place. And depending on who the focus of our top of our focus is, if it's the whole population, we call that universal. If it's people at high risk, we call that selective prevention. And it's people with maybe one or two early symptoms, we call that indicated prevention. And then moving on to secondary prevention, that's almost akin to early intervention. That's where someone has a condition, but you've caught it at the earliest possible opportunity, and then you're trying to provide the supports to achieve recovery. And tertiary prevention is often about trying to prevent, you know, uh, relapse and disability. So the fundamental way that prevention works or primary prevention works, should I say, is that it focuses on tackling risk and protective factors. That is the things that either increase the likelihood that you'll experience a condition or decrease the likelihood. Now, obviously, for primary prevention, you need to get in before the illness occurs or before the condition occurs. And as Sandro said, given that 75% uh, of conditions occur before age 25, we're really talking about tackling, you know, the perinatal period, infancy, childhood, adolescence and young adulthood. Um, you know, prevention activities typically target a cohort, a population, a group of people, be that children or adolescents. And it's, and it's done through usually non-mental health care settings. It's not necessarily in the clinic environment or in the hospital environment. It happens in the home, at school, at work, online or through community settings. And the important thing about prevention is that it has to be done at scale. You really need to be able to touch and impact on the lives of multiple, many uh, people to be able to uh, prevent mental health conditions. So... Uh, what are some of the traditional protective factors? Well, I won't go through these in detail, but they relate to some of the biological, psychological and social factors that are either intrinsic to us, like genes, temperament and personality, or that exist in the environments around us, in our family environment, um, in our school environment, in, in, in the workplace and in the broader community. And, and things like our uh, experience in early childhood, but also our life circumstances and how much access we have to some of the core social determinants of health and mental health, like education, adequate income and employment, they really make a difference. And uh, likewise, on the flip side, there are a range of risk factors. And in particular, things, the experience of trauma or the experience of a social exclusion um, or the experience of discrimination such as racism or homophobia or transphobia, have particularly negative impacts, um, particularly on the lives of uh, young people. So as Sandro alluded to, you know, last year was, you know, was a very difficult year for everyone, but it was disproportionately affected different age groups. And I think everyone recognises that young people uh, and, and women, and particularly young women, probably bore the brunt of a lot of the social and economic changes uh, that occurred last year. And that's been outlined in multiple reports, and um, Egan is going to be referring to one of those in a moment. But, you know, basically there were a range of um, new risk factors or a build-up of existing risk factors that occurred. Uh, I wanted to show a couple of slides that were prepared by Professor Deb Ball at University of Melbourne, showing the impacts uh, of COVID on young people's um, uh, em employment. And so, the, the line in red represents the, um, the drop in employment for young people and compare that to the sort of uh, middle-aged um, adults in black and the older Australians um, in grey. 
Um, and then whilst there's been a recovery, it's been uneven. So young people who are studying full time have been able to go back to some of their part time jobs. But young people that haven't been um, in, in, in study or, or training have actually not yet regained their employment. And, and so understandably, there's been an increase in financial stress. Um, and you can see from the top row there, the percentage of young people that report experiencing financial stress is significantly greater than um, other age groups. And then not surprisingly, they're also experiencing higher rates of mental distress. Um, so we, we know that we need to tackle those factors, that loss of social connectedness, that unemployment, the educational impacts. So how do we do it? Um, well, we're basically going to be using tried and true public health techniques. And so as Sandra alluded to last year, um, we uh, undertook a, a review of the evidence on behalf of Vic Health, looking at what works to prevent mental health conditions. So when you look at public education campaigns, which is one of the strings to the bow, there's not a lot of evidence for these because there's not a lot that have actually happened. Um, during the pandemic, uh, you know, there was a lot of information about where to go to seek help if you are struggling, but not as much information about what to do to stay well. Although there were campaigns like How's Your Head Today uh, that was run by the National Mental Health Commission that did have some of that content. But at the moment, there's not a lot of evidence to show whether that's going to work or not going to work. Uh, uh, by contrast, you know, building individual skills, um, there's a lot of evidence that that can help. So, you know, whether that's social and emotional learning programs that are happening in schools or resilience programs in schools and workplaces, or basic, you know, learning self-care skills, skills derived from health psychology or clinical psychology or positive psychology, there's actually quite a lot of good evidence that teaching people those life skills can help them cope better with stress and reduce the risk of them experiencing depression and anxiety in particular. In, in terms of other skills, we also know that parenting programs can be uh, very effective in trying to both uh, prevent, but also manage or treat mental health conditions that might affect children and young people. And so here's some examples of some of the programs that have been developed in Australia, Right at Home, which is a home nurse visiting program uh, to prevent uh, you know, difficulties in the perinatal period, Triple P, tuning into kids and teens and partners in parenting. So trying to change the family environment around young people can also have very positive effects. Likewise, trying to change the school environment or the university environment or the workplace environment. Now, there's, there's a lot of evidence around mental health promoting schools where, you know, you take a whole of school approach to try to influence the school climate and the partnership schools had with external agencies, um, but also the programs that have been delivered in the classroom to teach those social emotional learning and other resilient skills. Um, and more recently, you know, interest has sort of started to increase around workplace mental well-being. So there's good evidence uh, for schools program and I think fairly solid emerging evidence for workplaces and hopefully for universities coming up soon. You can also tackle this at a community uh, level where you get people together to try to deal with some of the local issues, the local risk and protective factors in their community. And a perfect example of this sort of approach is the communities that care model. It was originally developed for reducing alcohol and substance use amongst young people and offending behaviour for which it shows great impacts. And now um, people are looking at whether it can be used to help you know, build things like social connectedness and decrease the risk of depression and anxiety. But it's not all about programs. And as we saw during the pandemic, it's also some of the public health policies or social policies that we introduced that can make a huge difference to people's lives. You know, we saw the benefits of the Job Seeker Coronavirus Supplement and Job Keeper in keeping people out of poverty and reducing the stress in their lives. And so we need those sort of measures moving forward, particularly targeted to young people and helping them to re-establish a foothold um, in the, in the um, workplace um, and the labour market. But we, we need to do more to keep tackling some of these negative social factors that are contributing to stress in young people's lives, the gender inequality and gendered violence, the racism, trans and homophobia. I, I think, you know, 
it's not all about trying to teach people coping skills. It's about changing the environments and the situation around them. So, in short, we need a multimodal, multi-sector approach. There's no one strategy that's going to prevent every mental health condition and no sector can do it all. So that means we need a governance structure. You know, we need leadership from the top. We also need coordination and we need almost like the mirror of the mental health care system. We need a prevention system that has interventions and delivery systems and a workforce, but its own data and monitoring system to track progress. And in particular, we need funding. I mean, at the moment, less than 1% of the total mental health budget is directed to trying to prevent conditions from occurring in the first place. And 99% is spent on, you know, in some ways, picking up the pieces and supporting young people after they've become unwell. And of course, we need more research and evaluation. Briefly to touch on the Royal Commission, I think it did a fantastic job in highlighting and um, some proposals that will make a real difference because it does touch on what we've just said, those governance structures. And in particular, the establishment of a mental health and wellbeing promotion office in the Department of Health, I think is a game changer because that office will be led by an expert in mental health promotion. It will plan what needs to happen across the state. It will have a dedicated budget for prevention um, initiatives. Um, and I think that that's going to make a huge difference. So I'm um, just conscious of the time. Um, so in summary, mental health promotion and mental health care are separate, but they operate in tandem for the greatest impact. We need to move beyond just, you know, managing conditions and try to tackle the underlying root causes, uh, as well as supporting young people who are experiencing distress. And that requires a mixture of evidence-based programs, but also public policies or social policies that uh, support more mentally healthy environments. And I think the Royal Commission has really um, introduce some great recommendations, although I think they're going to have to be nuanced to young people's specific needs moving forward. Um, and I might stop there. Thanks very much. Over to you, Tina. Thank you, Stephen, for the very informative presentation. I think for us to understand that young people were disproportionately impacted just re-emphasises the importance of including young voices in policymaking decisions. And in the theme of elevating youth voices, our next speakers are Claire O'Brien and Jack Smith, who are both part of the Reimagining Young People's Futures Youth Steering Group. Claire is currently studying a Bachelor of International Public Health to UNSW and is involved with various organisations, including the Public Health Association of Australia, YACBIC, and the YWCA. She's passionate about addressing health disparities and promoting mental health wellbeing. Jack is currently studying a Bachelor of Applied Science and a Master's of Occupational Therapy at La Trobe University. He's been involved in the youth mental health and advocacy space and is a member of the Origin Youth Action Council and was also a volunteer on the 2020 Youth Parliament Program. Jack is also a member of the 2021 Youth Congress and was recently elected the Bendigo Youth Mayor. Oh, that's good. I can say I know the Bendigo Youth Mayor. <laughs> Over to you, Jack and um, Claire. Great, thank you, Tina. Hi, everyone. My name's Claire. I use she, her pronouns, and today I'm on the land of the Boonwurrung people of the Kulin Nation. Today, I'll be telling you my personal story of social disconnection and loneliness. I'll also be sharing some thoughts on what we can do to address these issues amongst young people going forward. I moved to Melbourne for university after graduating high school a few years ago. I found the first few years living away from my family and navigating life by myself to be quite stressful and challenging. I would try to keep myself busy to distract from discomfort. While I may have been meeting many new people in Melbourne and making many new connections, I did not form strong relationships with a lot of people. I found out I had no one to speak to about how I was feeling, especially because the majority of my friends were still living in my hometown and did not understand the huge, huge transition that I had made. Despite perhaps appearing social and having many online friends, I felt I had no one to connect to or talk to or trust. I know I'm not alone in feeling this way. We saw over uh, during the pandemic that there was an increase in social media use. 
However, this didn't necessarily translate to an increased connectedness amongst people. What I think would have been great and would have, what would have really helped me would have been an environment where I felt safe and free to socialise, but also to share personal stories if I wanted to, without feeling the need or expectation to do this. I think groups like this would be really great for mental, be mental well-being in general. A good example are the social huddles put together by Yakvik during the pandemic. As described by Yakvik, these huddles are a place to unwind, relax, and just chill out with other young people. I'm sure this is not the only example of this type of group. However, I'm not aware of any others with a focus on young people. So more communication and promotion of groups like this is, is vital so that the people who will actually benefit are aware of what is available. I also found that travel restrictions, financial stress, and working from home during COVID-19 really contributed to the feelings of isolation. Personally, I began a new job in the months before we went into lockdown, and I anticipated this would be a chance to grow and to make some new friendships among colleagues. But I rather quickly had to transfer to working from home, and I lost these opportunities. I found myself navigating on the job training and setbacks by myself, Feeling more and more isolated as time passed, and I realized that I would not be returning, uh, things would not be returning to normal anytime soon. For the majority of youth, disruptions caused by the pandemic occurred around life milestones, such as entry into adulthood, graduation, and moving out of home. But also during transition phases, as young people got new jobs and focused on travel and relationships. We know that late adolescence and early adulthood are vital periods for establishing lifelong health attitudes and behaviours. So the programs are required to assist in recovery and invest in mental health. I am pleased to see that the Royal Commission into Victoria's mental health system really focuses on the need to take a new approach to supporting good mental health and wellbeing. And having a focus on lived experience also seems to be a key theme, which is great. It is validating to see the importance of mental well-being and lived experience acknowledged. I think going forward, it's really important to collaborate and co-design programs with young people, to invest in prevention and in positive well-being and social connection programs. I hope to see the development of the community collectives as recommended in the Royal Commission, as I believe this will be a great way to improve social connection but they must be designed by grassroots organisations who are already on the ground going about this work and speaking with young people who are feeling the disconnect and loneliness I've spoken about today. Young people are the experts in their own lives and challenges, and so it is important to place them at the centre of championing the design and development of mental wellbeing initiatives. Thank you, everyone. Back to you, Tina. Thank you so much, Claire, for sharing your experiences. I think it's um, just like you said, it's really, really important to have a, a focus on, on lived experiences. So thanks for that. Um, next, let's hear from Jack Smith. Thanks, Tina. Um, thanks everyone for listening. I think um, young people are the perfect people to have run this after the last year of uni lectures and uni oral presentations over Zoom. I think we're quite prepared for this. So. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for coming. So, hello, everyone. My name is Jack. Uh, I use he, him pronouns. Today, I'm speaking from the lands of the Judge Overrun people in Bendigo. Um, today, I'm lucky enough to share my views for the future of mental health in Victoria. And I want to focus on young people in regional and rural communities because that's where my experience comes from. So, I I'd like for you guys to reflect for a second. And when I say regional and rural, where do you think of? You know, I think of Mervyn and Charlton, Ararat and Serpentine. I think about small farming communities don't have access to doctors, let alone mental health care. You may have never heard of some of the places, places I've mentioned, and I'm here to make sure those are the places we don't forget. I'd like to tell you what I see and how we can make a difference, not trying to fix everything, but to make a difference that might save a life. I'd like to tell you a story so I have a friend who lived on a farm an hour out of Mildura her whole life. It's very remote. It's about eight hours away from Melbourne. And my friend didn't even have internet until she was 14. 
you know, they went through some tough times on the farm she lived on. And I'm so happy to, to say because of, you know, the rural environment she was in and support from her family and friends that she was, you know, okay during these times of, of drought and hardship. But uh, you could say she is one of the lucky ones because she had support for her mental health and didn't end up in a crisis situation. But I had another friend who did get into a crisis situation. He was admitted to hospital. And when I went to visit him, I was absolutely mortified. When I visited him in the mental health ward, an elderly man walked out with a cane and handed it to the nurse that he knew by name as if he was there regularly. I couldn't imagine how my friend felt at that moment. Perhaps he felt as if he may never get out stank of smoke and there were no young people around him. It nearly put me off visiting him again. Perhaps being there stopped him from getting better sooner. Following on from these stories, I'd like to talk about the interim, the small steps we can quickly make to improve the lives of so many. The long-term ideas are important, but my question is, what can we do now for the forgotten areas of Victoria? Young people living there might not need top-of-the-line treatment, but they need more than they're getting now. What can we do for young people before they hit a crisis point? What can we do for people in remote areas that have no one to talk to or no support? And what can we do for young people who, because of their lack of support, end up in a mental health ward, rural hospital, smells of smoke, and is not designed for young people? Optimally, we would have in-person support and social connection in real life for all of these people. Currently, that simply isn't the reality and probably won't be for a while. It's great to see the Royal Commission report and other big changes coming. But while we work towards those changes, I think we need to focus on the small things. I think we need to pay more attention to telehealth. Overall, we must make telehealth a bigger part of the conversation. Telehealth is a genuine lifesaver, as we've seen during the pandemic. There are so many reasons telehealth is an important tool. We would finally be giving some remote communities immediate access to services, some for the first time, whilst not the same as in-person treatment. And I stress, I do not believe it is a replacement for in-person treatment. It means there's someone to talk to who can help and then and help them right now. I was reflecting on what telehealth services people did have access to. And I believe probably currently easiest telehealth service for people to access is Lifeline. Now, this service is important, but connecting people with telehealth services before they reach crisis could save so much anguish. Telehealth could also be used better long before a crisis point. Rural communities are close-knit and supportive of each other, but we're not mental health professionals. We can only do so much. There are a lot of ways that digital technology can be used to help people, to help uh, and connect each other, and to professionals. This could include teachers, school nurses, youth workers, sports coaches, employers, and obviously the focus of this presentation mental health professionals. There are all kinds of people who can influence good mental health for young people. But those agencies and clubs and councils need to make sure they give young people good digital access. We shouldn't expect them to make the trek hours away to get mental health care or personal support. Young people can't on their own get better access to these things. The community needs to reach out to young people. And so do mental health professionals, using all of the tools we now have at our fingertips. I know telehealth isn't the perfect solution, but it has a big part to play in improving services statewide. I think about my own experience and the people that I know, and a service like that could help them so much. So let's make a small step before we can leave. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Jack. Um, these are such important questions. You know, what, what can we do for young people before they hit a crisis point? What practical steps can we take to help people right now? I hope we can sort of think and reflect about these questions. Thank you.
Um, and someone that might actually be able to answer some of these, particularly when we sort of talk about that digital space, is our next speaker, Dr. Megan Lim, who is the Deputy Program Director, Behaviours and Health Risks at the Bernie Institute. Dr. Lim's primary area of expertise is investigating the role of new communication technologies in public health. She has conducted extensive research into how these technologies, such as mobile phones, smartphone apps, and social networking sites can be used for health promotion, as well as how the media can expose young people to health risks. Over to you, Dr. Lim. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Tina, for that great introduction. Um, I wish I had answers to all those problems, but I think, unfortunately, I may just be talking about a few more problems. Um, so I'm going to be talking about a study called, we called Coping with COVID, um, and it's about young people's experiences during the pandemic. Um, so the Coping with COVID study, we, we started in March 2020, um, a year ago, um, and the aim of the study was to understand and address the impact of the COVID pandemic on young Australians' mental health, social wellbeing and health behaviours. And the reason why we did this study was because we suspected that young people would be disproportionately impacted by changes in the economy due to COVID, even if they weren't necessarily um, heavily impacted in terms of the health and medical outcomes of COVID. Um, we also knew that young people already experienced higher rates of loneliness um, than the rest of the population and that they are more reliant on outside of the home social connections than older people may be. Um, we also were concerned that there was a risk of negative changes in health behaviours. So um, things like drinking more alcohol because you're just stuck at home alone, um, risks online, um, and also you know, reduced um, physical activity, um, sleep disturbances and poor nutrition. Um, and we also knew that it was really under, important to understand what young people were experiencing um, during the pandemic, because in Victoria, during the second wave of COVID um, infections, young people were um, being experiencing the highest number of infections. So understanding how they were feeling at the time was vital for um, you know, shutting down that the, the epidemic. Um, so the Coping with COVID study is huge. Um, I could talk about it all day easily, but I'm just going to give a few of the highlights um, in this presentation. Um, the first part of the study was a survey of 2,000 young Australians. So that's people from across the country, not just in Victoria, um, aged between 15 and 29. Um, we started recruiting people in April in 2020, so right at the height of the first wave. Um, and then we have repeated measures. So um, wave two was conducted when we were in the second wave in Victoria, but the rest of the country was kind of as normal. Wave three was conducted mostly overlapping at a time where um, we were all coming out of restrictions, everything was returning to COVID normal. And wave four, hopefully, is um, looking at a time when COVID is behind us. Um, and I'm really hoping we don't end up having a third wave, um, although it would be interesting for the study. Um, the second part of the study was um, a series of qualitative interviews where we focused in a lot more depth on young people's experiences and social well-being during the pandemic. And the third part of the study was a short group of co-design workshops where we really wanted to understand issues around loneliness and social isolation and come up with some strategies and suggestions for staying connected, um, both during the pandemic and in general. Um, so I'm only going to talk a little bit about a few of these um, parts of the study. So wave one and two of the COVID study, um, the, sorry, the surveys, and a little bit about the workshops. So um, you heard earlier from Sandra and Stephen that young people's mental health um, and general health wasn't doing too well at the beginning of the pandemic. But we found that between time point one and two, so between sort of the first wave and the second wave, there actually were overall improvements um, looking at Australia as a whole. So more people, well, sorry, at time point one, 69% of people were working at home or studying at home, and this dropped to 54% at time point two. Um, between time point one and time point two, um, the majority of people had an increase in their hours of paid work and more people felt more financially secure. 
Um, so you can see that people are starting to move a bit back towards normal in terms of their economic outcomes. Um, but this really differed if you were in Victoria. So you can see some quotes from young people there. Um, the first one shows that in South Australia, things are mostly back to normal. Um, but the second one is a young woman in Victoria, and she says that her family in Queensland are you know, um, going about their lives as normal, whereas her life in Victoria was certainly not normal. Um, this graph here is looking at depression symptoms. So essentially the higher the bar there, the more depressed you feel. Um, and you can see that between time point one and time point two, so the first wave and the second wave of the pandemic, um, depression did decrease overall in all groups, um, with the exception of the um, Victorian um, population where there was a slight increase in depression scores. And we need to do some more research into this to really understand um, the implications of that. Um, so another question we asked was, what do young people care about? And um, just in case it's not obvious, this um, horrible stock image is used completely ironically. Um, so we asked young people what their top three issues of concern were at the moment. And it does differ a little bit by the age groups. So for, for all the young people in our study, mental health and coronavirus were among the top issues of the time. But in the youngest group, um, education and friendships were very high on the list. Whereas for those in their 20s, um, employment, finances and money were um, the more pressing issues. Um, I think it's really important to note as well that for all three age groups, climate change made the top five um, issues of concern. So despite the um, immediate focus on COVID, young people were still very focused on the long-term issue that is you know, um, going to face us all. We asked young people what they wanted from those in power. So politicians, um, their, their schools, universities, workplaces, um, from public health professionals. And some of the key things they talked about were increased access to mental health care and more funding for mental health care. Um, and that was, um, you know, see, there were the, um, the addition of extra um, Medicare rebates put in place, but young people talked about the fact that um, seeing a psychologist, even with the Medicare rebate, still usually left a gap of over $100 per session, and that just wasn't affordable for most young people. Um, they also talked about um, job keeper and job seeker payments. They recognised that these were um, a really positive um, intervention, but they just didn't do enough. Um, you know, it had already been announced that these were going to be ending, and they also just didn't reach everybody. So a lot of people missed out on these payments, um, whether because they were international students um, or non-residents, or because they just didn't meet the work criteria. Um, they also talked a lot about having clarity and leniency from their schools and university about assessments. Um, they felt it was they were very up in the air about what was happening with their final exams and whether they would even be able to go to uni the next year. Um, and they also talked about programs. Um, I think this is related to what Stephen was talking about before about the prevention aspect of mental health. They really saw a need for those sort of programs that could um, connect them um, young people also really expressed feeling quite angry and frustrated. Um, they many cited the rising cost of education, so university um, tuition fees, a lack of job opportunities, um, particularly in sectors that young people really cared about, like the arts. Um, they talked about their schools and workplaces still not functioning, so still not getting the tech right. Um, although I think we all understand it's not that easy to get tech right, as we've seen today. Um, but yeah, young people were very frustrated with the constant you know, sort of in and out of school, face-to-face um, -face learning. Um, some felt they were being kind of ripped off by not getting to go into school or uni in person, but others felt like they were being forced to go back to their schools or their workplaces when they didn't feel it was safe. Um, and there was a lot of talk about important issues about their futures being sidelined during the pandemic, particularly climate change, um, but also, yeah, things like um, um, funding for arts and science and universities being really sidelined. Um, so I think th these quotes here really illustrate it well, um, which you can read. Um, 
So um, now I'm just going to move on to the co-design workshops that we conducted. We had to do these online, obviously. We couldn't do them face-to-face, -face, but we um, the, the workshops used sort of creative methods to have a group of eight young people discussing um, how they perceive the problems of social isolation and social connection um, and working towards solutions for addressing these. Um, so first of all, just a few definitions because these terms do get used interchangeably a little bit. Um, so social connection refers to a person's subjective sense of close and positively experienced relationships with others. So you can say whether you feel socially connected or not. Um, and yeah, obviously it's a good thing to feel socially connected. Whereas social isolation is an objective measure that can be quantified through the number of social contacts a person has. So if I have five friends that I see every week and you have six friends that you see every week, you're, sorry, I'm more socially isolated than you. Um, even if I feel like um, my friends are, you know, really close and positive relationships, but, you know, they might be just acquaintances. Um, it's just kind of about numbers that can be quantified. Um, Whereas loneliness um, is a subjective and emotional and unpleasant experience where there's a discrepancy between your desired and perceived social interactions. So that means that you might have hundreds of close friends but still feel lonely, or you might have one really one just one friend or no friends and be perfectly fine with that and not feel lonely. Um, so we focused in this on social connection because it's a positive outcome that we wanted to work towards. Um, these findings here summarise um, discussion around how COVID influenced social connection. Um, so some of the findings were that we developed a new appreciation for face-to-face -face contact with people. Um, we realised how important incidental or forced connection can be in our lives. So that's um, just the people you see at school or work or at the shops or, you know, sporting events or whatever, um, who you might not really consider friends, um, but I think once they're taken away from you, you realise that you do really miss them. Um, in a positive way, some people said that slowing down made them reflect more on what they need um, and what their issues with social connection are. Um, another positive was that we did start talking about mental health. Like it kind of became okay to admit that you weren't feeling great in mental health. Um, and it also became more normal to... Um, talk about being socially isolated and a lot of young people say that they they felt weird before that they only had online friends but then suddenly it became normal um, so they felt more normal um, and also the shared experience made us feel part of something bigger so we def definitely developed a real identity as Melburnians or as Victorians um, and we'd all been through this thing together so um, yeah it gave a sense of community like working together and also just like something to talk about. Um, so, you know, you can, it's so easy now to have small talk with people because we've all gone through this thing together. Um, we talked about what, how to design a, a space or an activity that would facilitate connection between people. Um, and so for young people, it was really important that it was free and easy to access. It had to be authentic and appealing. So not um, really obvious that it was made for old people, for young people, um, but made by young people. Um, had to have a connection friendly atmosphere and um, using things like projects. So um, having, I guess, a goal or an activity that was something that people could do together rather than just saying, hey, or go hang out and be friends, um, like giving them something to work on where friendship develops um, as a side to that. Um, having a pro connection environment, which refers to the physical space um, being conducive to connection. Um, having a strengths and interest-based approach. So, yeah, talking about positive things um, rather than, you know, hey, lonely people come hang out here. Um, and it had to cater for people without existing social skills and connections. So I think a lot of the problems with um, social connection activities is that they're really just targeted towards the people who are already very involved in a lot of things and are able to involve themselves and put their hands up for things. Um, so key policy recommendations from this study are to give young people a voice in policy making and communications, which is obviously something Big Health are trying to achieve through this um, sort of program, um, to increase access to bulk build mental health care and to invest in well-designed social connection programs that cater to those who really need them. Um, I, think, I just thought I'd 
flag this um, Spotify playlist we made as part of our survey. We asked the 2,000 young people to tell us what song was getting them through isolation. Um, and I think some of those are um, kind of funny ones, and but overall they were quite uplifting songs and, yeah, you know, hopeful songs. Um, and, yeah, you can get that on Spotify if you're interested. Um, also, you can um, access more, a lot more detail about some of our study results, um, including the main report from the first um, wave of the survey, which you can find on the Burnett or the Vic Health websites. Um, and I'd like to thank my awesome team who've actually done all of this work and Vic Health for providing funding. And yeah, these are my contact details. So thanks, and I'll hand back to Tina. Thank you, Megan. I'm not sure about everyone else, but I am not a math person. So it's very interesting for me to hear about how you can quantify social isolation. But I'm also glad to hear that it's become more normal to talk about social isolation and also the benefits of the shared experience. I know as a Victorian, I definitely felt that last year. Um, just quickly before we move on, I just wanted to remind everyone that you can submit your questions to Slido if you haven't already. Um, if you're on a desktop, it should appear on the page. And if you're on a mobile, there is a tab at the top of the screen with a QA, and a um, which will um, take you to our submission page. You can also um, just vote on questions. If you find that someone's already asked a question that's similar to what you were thinking, you can just um, vote for them there. And again, we will try our best to get through as many as we can when we get to the Q&A session. Um, next, we have Andrew Leap and Lyndall is down. Sorry, Linda, if I said that wrong. <laughs> um, and they will share um, some of their personal experiences of coping through COVID. Um, Andrew is a recent VC graduate studying commerce um, and global studies at Monash University. He has been involved in many projects advocating for young people, several of which have been speaking to or working with policy makers in important areas such as education and health. Lyndall is in their second year of studying social science psychology at RMIT. And they are an engaged artist and writer with an interest in youth work. It sounds so awesome. <laughs> and are a member of their local council's Youth Wellbeing Advocacy Board, as well as Big Health's Youth Advisory Board. So really looking forward to hearing from both of you. Um, Andrew, how about you go first? Thank you, Tina. Um, as Tina mentioned, my name's Andrew Leap. I use he, him pronouns, and I'd also like to start off by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land that we're all meeting here today and pay my respects to elders past and present, as well as any Indigenous people who may be with us here today. The COVID-19 lockdown, particularly in Victoria, was hard for a lot of people. Some young people were able to make the most of the restrictions and use the time to reflect strengthen existing social connections, and even make new social connections that they wouldn't have if it wasn't for the pandemic. However, there was a lot of young people who found last year extremely demoralizing and isolating. A lot of students, including myself, loved being able to see people throughout the day at school, catching up with them in between classes and casual conversations to check in and see how they're going. This was reduced to just profile pictures on a screen as many young people were even reluctant to turn on their cameras so you, could, you couldn't even see their faces anymore during, during online classes. Unfortunately, with schools closed and the transition to remote learning, this closed off a social, avenue, social connection avenue, particularly for students who consider school as their safe space from everything else that's happening in their life. I was part of initiatives such as Breakfast Club, where we would give staff and students the opportunity to catch up with each other and have breakfast before school once a week. The food and the in-person interaction wasn't something that you were able to replicate online, so it was disappointing not being able to run that. Personally, I was quite lucky to be able to maintain social connect my social connections throughout lockdown, but I know many other people who struggled to even get out of bed in the morning because they just didn't have the motivation to do anything. A lot of Year 12s in particular were looking forward to so many rites of passage, formals, valedictories, last sport carnivals, and moments shared in the Year 12 common room. For me, I would have loved to have been able to just spend more time with my friends, even the little moments like studying in the library or going out for lunch, just to remember my last year as a high school student. It was very demotivating for a lot of students to have these expectations at the start of the year evaporate and be replaced by a screen for most of 2020. I think this highlights the importance of having strong, reliable social connections. And I believe that this has to be a strong emphasis for schools, 
Many schools, such as my high school, were quick to adapt and establish wellbeing initiatives and protocols for support. However, I know many other students that weren't as lucky. On a broader level though, I think this also highlights the importance of investing in physical, social and mental health, particularly within a school environment. Programs to regularly provide information and resources to young people to educate them on the importance of maintaining good health should be considered as well as to encourage them with different ways to stay resilient and proactive. Young people are going through a rapid period of change and having the resources to feel supported can make all the difference. Like social connections, the quality of education was also varied across the state within primary, secondary and tertiary institutions. From talking with students and teachers, many young people were able to thrive throughout remote learning. Students who struggled in the classroom, in the classroom to complete coursework were able to use their time more effectively throughout lockdown and man managed to stay on top of things. However, many other students were disadvantaged as a result of the online learning experience. Young people who thrive of having others around them in the classroom just couldn't learn anything online. Many schools spent a significant amount of time transitioning into remote learning, which meant a lot of time lost, particularly for year 12 students. Many students saw their grades drop dramatically and had to learn everything when they came back to school. The pandemic also exacerbated the inequalities we currently face in society. This includes having limited space to learn, not enough devices for each student and having poor internet access. I want to applaud the Victorian Government and the Department of Education and Training for their laptop and internet dongle initiative which gave devices and internet access to students who couldn't afford it. And I think this highlights how when there's a need and a will, there's a way to ensure that we can close the gaps and help achieve the best possible outcomes for all students. I think there's a strong need to ensure that we take the lessons we've learned from 2020 into consideration for the future. Young people don't want to return back to normal. We want a better future, especially now we know what's possible. How do we incorporate flexible learning into the classroom pedagogy? How do we make sure that no student is left behind in their learning while also making sure that we promote the growth of resilience and proactiveness? How do we ensure that physical, social and mental health are emphasised as a priority for young people in line with academics and extracurricular? An analogy that I like to use is that we're not all in the same boat. We're in the same ocean. Some, some of us have rickety wooden boats that have holes in them and are at risk of sinking. Others are on yachts sailing through. And of course, there's everything in between. We all have a role to play in recovering from this pandemic. It's up to governments, education institutions, as, also, as well as everyone in our community to ensure regardless of, the, of everyone's boat, we make it through the harsh ocean of the pandemic while setting all young people up to achieve their full potential. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. I really like your analogy. We're not on the same boat, we're in the same ocean. I'll definitely, oh, sorry, am I on me? Oh, I'll definitely be using that. Um, next, we have Lindo. Over to you. Hi. Um, I would just like to say that I am sharing from Wurundjeri land today, and I'd like to pay my respects to the Aboriginal community, elders, past, present, and emerging on whose land that I live as an uninvited guest. So um, I'm Lyndall, I'm 19, I'm Butch, and I'm a young person studying social science psychology with a passion for creative art. I'll be focusing in on how COVID-19 and its subsequent lockdowns created financial distress and insecurity for young people, and how this has an impact on mental and emotional well-being in a time of loss of control, independence, and hope. I lost my job as a waiter during lockdown because I was on a casual contract. I also wasn't afforded any student financial support due to a parent maintaining his job and income from home. But this didn't mean that I was able to earn any of my own money or save for almost the entirety of 2020. For a young person, this is deeply impactful, as many of us work to save money for moving out, for our personal expression, and ultimately transitioning towards independence in our lives. We're being asked to set our life plans in motion, sort out our career paths, go to school, move out. But as someone who made $40 a month from a local council gig with few other sources of income when I picked up a freelance art job, this was impossible. This was also especially concerning given how many young people are students and casual workers. How many missed out on compensation for unemployment because of their forced dependence on guardians with an income during a time of their own financial instability? 
We know already that many young people were forced to return home and become dependents because of job loss and being unable to afford the costs of independence. This would have also cut them off from financial support to regain said in independence. And how many young people have been set behind by slipping through the gaps like this, whilst young JobKeeper recipients who were also dependents were able to save the money they were given because they had a part-time contract? Given how many young people are disproportionately hired as casual workers, just how many young people were in a situation similar to myself? Even in my situation, I was privileged to have a family member who maintained their job from home that I was able to be dependent on and look to for support. Other young people may not have had the same, including those facing the intersections of being from marginalized communities. To emphasize the gravity of this situation, as someone with privilege, as someone I would still consider very lucky, I was deeply depressed. Youth is a stage where we process much fluctuation in our bodies and minds because we are transitioning. I lost a lot of weight during lockdown, which ruined my self-esteem because I was hanging on to small payments to be able to afford to buy clothes that actually fit me. Simple pleasures of lockdown culture, such as Uber Eats, would have taken up at least half of my monthly pay, and so I didn't have the option to indulge. Every monetary decision I made, I agonized over for days, trying to justify it. I am lucky, even now, to have been rehired after lockdown and be able to recover from the impacts of this with therapy and income to fix the issues I've faced. I know other young people who are not so lucky, who are still unemployed. The effects of lockdown still linger for them, the lack of control, the lack of hope to build and save for their future plans. I want to address that with more opportunities for young people to be employed in positions that value their input, such as what I am currently able to engage in with Vic Health and my local council. Without these positions, I, um, I may have had nothing during lockdown. If we start by employing more young people in more positions where they can guide and advise us out of lockdown into recovery, outlining what we want, we can, til we can kill two birds with one stone. We can give young people opportunities that are therapeutic, constructive and engaging, whilst also allowing them income and experience, which could further their chances of employment in a now extremely competitive environment. It would be even better if these contracts were not based in casualization, so as to give back control to young people so they can move forward with a sense of hope for their futures. Thanks for letting me speak. Thank you, um, Lindor, for sharing your very personal experience um, with us today. Really appreciate it. Um, I'd like, now like to move on to the panel discussion, um, which will include Dr. Megan Lim, Dr. Stephen Carbone, Andrew Leap, and Lindell again. And again, I'd like to encourage everyone to please submit um, your questions or vote for questions that are already on Slido. For the first question, I will open it up to uh, young members or young speakers from today. Um, our participants are really interested to know how you as young people were engaged in the youth steering group and what your role was. I would say that we've been able to start with the Reimagining Young People's Futures project with this webinar, like even having the opportunity to speak at an event alongside professionals has been just a great way to be involved but one of the best things about it to me is that this isn't where things end. We're gonna keep going forward. We're gonna keep having new ideas. Like this is just the beginning of this project. And we wanna see future events hosted. We wanna have more contact that's more close and personal with policymakers. So hopefully that can be, that can show that this is a constant journey and that we're going to keep being engaged as young people and directing these events so we can see tangible outcomes by the end. Thank you, I couldn't agree more. I'm hoping this is just the beginning. Um, and I'll open up the floor to, to any panel members that wants to speak to this next question. Um, are there any examples of co-designed social connection programs for young people that you know have worked really well? And could you speak to any of them? Um, How about um, Stephen or Megan? Yeah. Megan, why don't we start with you? With me, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't have a great answer for that. Um, I guess my knowledge is mostly of the 
peer reviewed academic literature, which hasn't covered this topic very well. I don't think. Um, I know Vic Health are working on multiple um, programs along these lines at the moment. Um, so yeah, hopefully more will be coming out. Um, yeah, I haven't really seen many examples, but I have also um, haven't yeah looked that yeah. hard. I think. Um, Thanks, Megan. It's just a, oh, sorry. Go go ahead, Stephen. Yeah. Look, I, I think it reflects in a in a sense what Lyndall was saying. Uh, I mean, one of the great things about the uh, Royal Commission is the emphasis on lived experience and co-design. And there's several initiatives that are in there about, you know, having um, consumer and carer voice front and centre. But I, I think that needs to, to also translate into the mental health promotion world. And, you know, when we're talking about programs to build social connectedness or social policy changes, you know, I think the group that Vic Health have got together is a perfect sort of example of the types of mechanisms that policy makers need to sort of, you know, use and, and be in contact with people, young people, about their lives, about what they think, you know, is important, about how they would construct a particular program or policy. Um, Co-design maybe hasn't happened enough um, uh, both in the mental health care, but also in the mental health promotion world. And I think this is a perfect opportunity, um, you know, for policymakers out there to be in contact uh, with the Youth Advisory Committee and get their input and get their support, you know, for the programs and uh, initiatives that they're going to be developing over the coming months. Thanks, Stephen. Um, Megan, you mentioned earlier, you spoke about a research project that you did that involved 3,000 young people around Australia. How did you find participants for the group and make sure that you had a diverse and accurate range um, and depiction of Australian youth? Um, so for that study, we use social media advertising. Um, and yeah, we just advertised and we had quotas for certain, um, mostly just for state-based and gender-based quotas. Um, yeah, as you often get with with surveys, um, I think we had an overrepresentation of women and of um, English speaking backgrounds and of more educated young people. Um, I'll also say though that in terms of our um, workshop, which was with a smaller number of people, um, we did get a much more diverse group, I think. Um, and I think we've, we've come to realise that it's really important to, um, to get a range of people who aren't just the usual sort of research participators. Um, it's important to pay people for their time um, in, a, um, you know, a way that really values their time. Um, that's kind of my main tip. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Megan. And just while I have you, <laughs> how did you measure loneliness over the various waves of the study? And I think you can sort of also build on, you know, you spoke also about social isolation. So like, is, would you say this is an objective measure, um, as you had suggested, or is it a kind of a risky definition to use in situations of poor mental health? Yeah. Um, so in terms of loneliness, yes, we measured that across um, all waves of the study. Um, there's more detail in the report, but um, it followed the same trend really as the um, depression symptoms that I showed. So um, between wave one and wave two of the COVID pandemic, um, this rate of loneliness did decrease overall, except for in the Victorian um, group. Um, and yes, yeah, social isolation, um, it is an objective measure and it is counted in terms of number of people that you see regularly. Um, but it it's it's useful in in many way, many ways, um, but it's also not useful in a lot of ways um, because it doesn't really reflect your experience. Um, and that's why we have in our work focused on social connection, which is a subjective experience and um, isn't measurable um, in the same way um, because it is a, and it's also a positive outcome, um, whereas social isolation is a negative outcome and you know, find it more helpful to focus on positives rather than negatives. Thank you. Thanks for that. Andrew, uh, I wondered, sorry. Um, yes, Andrew, so we might move time here from you in the spirit of youth-led voices. I wanted to know about ways in which young people felt their school education had prepared them to access resources to support their health during COVID. 
Yeah, um, that's a really good question. Um, from my personal experiences and from what I saw both at my own school as well as other schools uh, where my friends went to, um, some of the things included regular updates from our wellbeing team about resources that they can access externally. So places such as like Headspace, Beyond Blue um, and other avenues of support that they can go to if they needed it, um, as well as regular tips and tricks on how to maintain a healthy lifestyle, um, a healthy mental state, um, just giving us as many resources as possible um, through regular intervals to make sure that we felt supported throughout the lockdown, particularly during the second lockdown when it was, all, from my personal experience, much much more difficult than the first lockdown. Um, yeah. Thanks, thanks, Andrew. I can imagine it would be quite a difficult difficult time. And sort of just building on that, Stephen, what else do you think needs to be done to address the mental health stigma that stops young people from, from reaching out and, and telling their stories? You know, in terms of, you know, who do we think needs to act or, or lead? Yeah, look, I, I think uh, one of the big problems still in the mental health world is, you know, the stigma, you know, this idea that somehow, you know, to experience a depression or anxiety, you know, is a, a reflection on your character or, you know, and, and people still feel that embarrassment or, or that 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 shame. Um, and, and that's ridiculous. I mean, you know, these conditions are uh, like any other health condition, you know, uh, uh, we don't want to experience them, you know, it's distressing experience and, and it's not our fault, you know, they just, uh, you know, come upon us. And so I think the more that we talk about it and, and make it clear, um, you know, the, the way that uh, we've handled stigma is, you know, for people to be able to tell their stories and, and share their stories. And the more people hear how common it is and, and from people just like you, that you've gone through this and I felt this and it just sort of normalises it and takes away some of that, that stigma. So, um, and I also think it's, it's really important, you know, to help people understand that we're all human, we're all vulnerable, you know, this can happen to any of us. Uh, and it's okay to not be okay at times and it's okay to reach out and and ask for support and and even to get professional support so you know we just have to make people understand that it's just uh you know one in two people in their lifetime are going to experience a mental health condition i mean we're, 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 this is very common stuff so there's no need to make people feel like they're somehow different or um, other um this is just a normal human experience and we need to be compassionate and supportive Thanks, that's very, very Can true. I just add to that? Yeah. So that um, something that came through in our work as well was that young people were aware of um, resources for seeking help, but they saw it as being something for people who were worse off than them. So um, even if they were, they might have been experiencing more mild symptoms of um, mental health problems, but they saw the help that was available as being for people with more severe issues than them. So they didn't think that they deserved it. Um, and I think it's important for young people to understand, or all people to understand the importance of early intervention. Um, I think it's also, if we get people into that mindset, like I said at, the, at my presentation, we all have mental health or a level of mental health and well-being. We all need to look after our mental health and well-being, just like we look after our physical health. It's not other people, it's us, it's all of us. And so we need to learn how to understand how we're feeling um, and what self-care strategies we can use that Andrew sort of referred to and apply that to our day-to-day -day life and also to be attuned to when maybe our stress levels or our distress levels are rising to a point where we can't necessarily manage on our own and that's when we turn to friends family or you know online supports or professional people so everyone has mental health and that's why everyone needs to look after their mental health and well-being yeah Lindell, i'm keen to hear from you how how do you think councils can better support young people in work um, so I can probably talk about a couple of my experiences where I felt supported last year. Um, I was really lucky. I got um, a job with my local council to work on their youth panel, which is actually a really great initiative where they let young people have voices on what the council is doing locally throughout the year. And a lot of that had to do with lockdown. But another one of the, the things that we did was that we all worked as a team to make a queer health resource for young people during that time, which I felt was especially relevant when a lot of the young LGBT people were totally disconnected because of lockdown. So I found that really helpful and empowering to know that I was being heard 
whilst being given a job opportunity. And it was all very constructive and it was great to get to work with other young people and get connected to the young people who are directly in my community. And from that also came the job opportunity I got with Big Health. Um, I became part of their youth panel as well last year. And that was really amazing, just getting to know that a bigger organisation cared about hearing how we were doing and wanted our insights on things. Um, so that kind of job opportunity is just really wonderful. It's multifaceted. I actually got to talk to people who are higher up in council about their initiatives, the way that they were hosting studies on how we were doing during lockdown. Just those kinds of job, job opportunities are really good. And they're not only like helpful in making change in society, they're therapeutic for young people. So a great double-edged sword. That's great and quite practical as well. What about you, Andrew? Could you speak briefly about some of the good school wellbeing initiatives and protocols that worked well for you? Yeah, um, so from last year as a student leader, a lot of the things that um, I saw that worked quite well um, came from young people themselves. So within a school environment, um, being able to sit down with other leaders and thinking about, okay, so we're sort of in this rut at the moment um, and this whole morale throughout the school is quite low. What can we do as a school and as a student body um, to help improve that? And some of the things that we did, um, we looked at when we got back, we planned out some events for people to look forward to. Um, so we had things like big breakfasts and um, welcome back events for everybody to come back. Um, but we also worked with um, our house team or our student management team um, on just little things like through pastoral care or mental groups, as they're also known, um, like quizzes, um, prizes, like um, competitions for students to make videos about certain topics, just these little things that people can sort of put their mind towards um, to keep them going, to keep them motivated. Um, and I think that's really important. Thanks, Andrew. It is, it is really important. Um, because of technical difficulties, we weren't able to get to everyone's questions. So I'm really, really sorry um, about that, but we will try um, and get to that, um, that, to those questions that we couldn't get to um, in the session. But I do want to give an opportunity to each of the panel members to, if they had any last comments or anything that they'd like to speak to. Um, Stephen, why don't we start with you? Uh, thanks, Tina. Uh, look, I think one of the take-homes for me is that, you know, um, young people have borne the brunt. Uh, I think of, you know, COVID-19 uh, social and economic impacts, and I think we as a community have a debt to repay and an obligation to um, do what we can to really, um, you know, fast track the recovery, um, you know, for young people. And that's about their physical health, their mental health and wellbeing. And, um, you know, both through the programs that we've talked about that help boost mental wellbeing, but also the social policies that are clearly required. And young people need to be involved in those conversations and involved in helping to make those decisions. Thanks, Stephen. Um, what about you, um, Lyndall? Um, just that I'm really looking forward to seeing where we go from here. I remember feeling so um, silenced in my experiences in high school and getting to work with Vic Health and work on this Reimagining Young People's Future project makes me really excited to see just where we're going to go in the following months, especially coming from this and hearing back from policymakers. So thank you very much for the opportunity. That's good. Thank you. Um, Andrew? I think for me, the biggest take home message was um, uh, like Lyndall and Stephen said, um, seeing where this goes, but also seeing more opportunities for young people to have their input, um, both on a broader community level, but also within schools um, and making sure that we support people, um, students in the primary, secondary and tertiary sector in making sure that they look after their mental health, particularly this year. Um, coming back from remote learning um, and making sure that they feel supported and that they know how to access support services and that it is okay to not feel okay. And how about you, Megan? Any last um, one? I'll just finish by, I guess, saying that I'm incredibly inspired the more I work with young people like the amazing panellists who've spoken today and you as well, Tina. Um, yeah, young people have so much to offer um, 
and they really understand the issues facing society now and in the future much more than um, many of you know older people do. Um, and yeah, we obviously need to listen to them more and engage with them more, include them in policy making um, beyond just tokenistic inclusion, I guess, um, and trying to reach the more marginalised young people as well, not just the kind of usual suspects um, who present themselves forward. Those who may be reluctant to put themselves forward still have a lot to offer. Um, yeah, that's my summary of the day. Thanks, Megan. And thank you all speakers who have spoken today. It was really, um, really informative. I really enjoyed hearing everything that you had to present, uh, particularly hearing youth-led voices. I think that for me um, was really, really important. And I do hope that this is sort of the beginning of many to come. Um, just a reminder that this will be um, posted. So if you want further information, you can find this um, session on YouTube, on the Big Health YouTube page. Um, you can also check out the Big Health website, which is www.bighealth.big.gov.au. So for more information on the work um, that's being done there. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for all your lovely questions and um, I hope you have a good rest of the day. <laughs>